Welcome to you all this morning. I'm also very proud that Queen's is hosting this unique world-class conference with the University of Chicago. For the last number of months, our colleagues in the Senator George J. Mitchell Institute for Global Peace, Security and Justice here at Queen's and the Pearson Institute at the University of Chicago have been working together to prepare for this important conference. By joining forces, our two leading universities have used their academic strength to bring together a truly inspirational lineup of speakers. Over the next two days, we are privileged to be joined by world leaders, esteemed scholars, and those who are actively working on the ground in conflict areas. We all know, unfortunately, that conflict is inherent in society, and it's certainly not new. It's been with us for thousands of years, and its effects are long-lasting. Long-lasting economically, emotionally, educationally, and politically. Nothing, though, is more devastating than the impact on people. So this is a unique opportunity for us all. The conference provides an opportunity for us to take the time to refocus our minds and explore some vitally important global issues. It's also timely. 20 years after the Good Friday Agreement, we'll be looking back at the many lessons we've learned in Northern Ireland, lessons that are transferable to other areas of conflict. We will also hear about the path to peace in Colombia, and during tomorrow's conference, we'll explore the daunting challenges and the human toll of the world's current refugee crisis. This is sadly the largest population of displaced people since World War II. At Queen's University Belfast, these topics are very close to our heart. They're embedded in all that we do through the Senator George J. Mitchell Institute for Global Peace, Security and Justice, one of our flagship global research institutes here at Queen's. And I'd like to give an especially warm welcome to Senator Mitchell, who's joining us this morning as a keynote speaker. As always, we look forward to listening to and learning from his reflections. And I should also let you know that it's recently been Senator Mitchell's birthday, and I'd like to send him our best wishes for that. Now, the Mitchell Institute addresses the challenges of building a peaceful, secure, and inclusive world. Researchers from fields as diverse as politics, mental health, planning, and computer science have come together with a focus on four priority research areas. Legacy issues, justice and rights, security, ideology and beliefs. It aims through its research, education, and importantly, civic engagement, to make a real difference to the lives of ordinary people. With global ambitions and international expertise, the Institute makes a practical difference to the lives of these ordinary people, helping those who are struggling with the aftermath of conflict by empowering them to realize fairness, justice, and tolerance. I'm grateful to all of our speakers and panel members for dedicating their time to join us throughout the conference. The success of your joint efforts to date allows us to be optimistic. So I'm confident that over the course of the next two days, we can work together to address these global issues and shape a better future for all of society. To our audience, I'd like to welcome you again to Queen's University. I know you will find your visit both thought-provoking and enjoyable. And so, without further ado, I would now like to hand over to the President of the University of Chicago, Robert J. Zimmer, for his opening remarks. Thank you. and let me add my welcome to this conference on global uh, conflict, the human impact. Uh, this important conference has been co-convened by the Senator George J. Mitchell Institute for Global Peace, Security and Justice at Queen's University Belfast and the University of Chicago's Pearson Institute for the Study and Resolution of Global Conflicts. Uh, very importantly, it has been organized through the close work of colleagues at the two universities. 
Uh, we're very grateful to our counterparts at Queen's University Belfast for their partnership and for their graciousness as hosts here in Belfast. I would especially like to recognize and thank the Vice Chancellor of Queen's University Belfast, Ian Greer. Now, as you know, we have a remarkable set of distinguished attendees at this conference, and I would like to thank you all for coming. Uh, in particular, we're very grateful to, for the attendance of Bertie Ahern, uh, former Taoiseach, Republic of Ireland, and Lord David Trimble, PC, former First Minister, Northern Ireland. We're privileged to be joined by Senator George J. Mitchell and tomorrow by Filippo Grandi, the United States High Commissioner for Refugees. The perspectives and expertise of each of these individuals will contribute immeasurably to the discussions over these two days and beyond. Uh, we're also joined uh, today by three members of the University of Chicago Board of Trustees, uh, Joe Neubauer, our board chair, who is here with Jeanette Lehrman Neubauer, Mary Lou Gorno, and Emily Nicklin, who is here with Jack Callahan. Uh, finally, I would like to recognize Dan Shapiro, who is here as a representative of the Thomas L. Pearson and Pearson Family Members Foundation, which provided the landmark gift that created the Pearson Institute at the University of Chicago. Now, the nature of conflicts that we see around the world, both now and in the past, are, of course, varied, but they reflect deeply on the human condition. The impact on individuals and groups of individuals can be devastating, as we see right now by the massive number of refugees in the world seeking safety. Well, some of these conflicts can be fairly ascribed to simple and inappropriate use of power, we also see conflicts of deep historical roots reflecting religious, ethnic, family, national, cultural, or ideological differences that for one reason or another escalate into violent conflict. Thus, the human element, whether in matters leading to conflict or in the impact of conflict, is central to understanding these conflicts. It's a critical element connected to but beyond the important political and economic factors that are often recognized. The human element simultaneously makes resolution of conflict a very major challenge and an absolute imperative. It is, of course, fitting that we gather here in Belfast to engage in this work here in Northern Ireland, 20 years after the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, conflict resolution remains a living and dynamic process where much has been accomplished with more work remaining. What has been accomplished represents not only a great advance for the people living in common on this beautiful island, but is a stimulus for further work. At the same time, it is a signal to the world that difficult, emotionally charged, deep-rooted and violent conflict can in fact be resolved successfully and support human flourishing. The challenge for us all here today in discussing global conflicts is to try to bring a combination of academic research capability and true experience in dealing with conflicts to see our way through all the complexities and develop greater understanding of how conflicts can be resolved and therefore hopefully contribute to their resolution. This task has a particular meaning for us at the University of Chicago as this is an essential part of the mission of the Pearson Institute for the Study and Resolution of Global Conflicts, which was established at our Harris School for Public Policy in 2015. Pearson Institute focuses on three main areas. Research to understand, prevent, and resolve violent conflicts through evidence-based and data-driven approaches. Engagement of international communities to advance evidence-based approaches and policies, including through intense engagement at events like this conference and a forthcoming Pearson Global Forum in Chicago. And education for the next generation of scholars and practitioners trained and engaged in evidence-based resolution of global conflicts. Uh, we are deeply gratified and appreciative of this opportunity to engage with all of you here today through our joint efforts with Queen's University Belfast on this issue of utmost importance for humankind. Thank you, and once again, welcome.
It's a great pleasure to continue the introduction to this conference and to welcome our distinguished keynote speaker this morning. Central to the work of all great universities is the public discussion of major global problems. The gathering together of people with diverse backgrounds and expertise and wisdom, such as we have with us over the next couple of days, to reflect on some of the most pressing issues that we all face. One such issue, unquestionably, is the understanding and the ending of violent political conflict. And arguably, there is no better place to reflect together on that question than here in Belfast. Our panel later this morning, Northern Ireland, How Peace Was Built, features a group of experienced figures who, together with our first keynote speaker, made a decisive contribution to ending the conflict here in Northern Ireland. This afternoon, we're privileged to have another distinguished keynote address from a major figure, followed by an equally distinguished panel, each of them considering the vital subject, Colombia, the path to peace. Every conflict is, of course, unique. But as we reflect on the theme of global conflict here in Belfast, we can consider how far there are echoes between different contexts, as each conflict takes its particular complex journey. The Northern Ireland peace process saw important leadership from key figures across many different political parties and groups and traditions. It witnessed leadership at very local level, as well as significant international involvement, and each of those aspects is reflected in our guests today. It was a far from inevitable process, the anniversary this month of the terrible Omer bomb of August 1998, reminding us how far from certain peace was or seemed in the aftermath of that atrocity. Nor was it a process which resulted in any of the main protagonists gaining clear victory. Instead, a series of painfully agreed compromises involved unpleasant aspects for almost everyone, but also sufficient rewards to sustain majority support and engagement. The Northern Ireland peace process did not end all political violence here, and it certainly didn't end political division in this society. But what it did demonstrate, and what it will be so valuable to hear our Colombian experts reflect on in regard to their own experience on the path to peace in Colombia, was that seemingly unending violent conflicts might largely be brought to an end without the securing of the rhetorically expressed victory so long demanded by violent actors. So in terms of the causation, sustenance, resolution and legacies of violent conflicts, the Colombian and Northern Irish cases allow us to reflect richly on what is unique and on what is family resemblant across different settings. And amid all this from Northern Ireland to Colombia to the many other conflicts spilling blood today from Syria to Iraq to Israel, Palestine and beyond, the victims of violence should be at the forefront of our thinking. Our conference title, Global Conflict, The Human Impact, vividly reflects that. And the work of the University of Chicago's Pearson Institute for the Study and Resolution of Global Conflicts and of Queen's University's Senator George J. Mitchell Institute for Global Peace, Security and Justice reflects and respects that priority. So it's fitting that tomorrow we will hear from global experts on one of the most terrible of human plights, that of refugees, from our keynote speaker and panel discussants, and we will all learn much from that. As we do reflect on these major problems, I can think of nobody better able to deliver our opening keynote address than Senator George J. Mitchell. Such a distinguished politician and peacemaker, and such a great friend both to Queen's University Belfast and to wider society here in Northern Ireland. Senator Mitchell was the inaugural United States Special Envoy for Northern Ireland during 1995 to 1998, 
a position to which he was appointed by President Bill Clinton. He was chair of the Northern Ireland Peace Talks, which resulted in the 1998 Belfast Good Friday Agreement, and was also United States Special Envoy to the Middle East between 2009 and 2011. Here at Queen's, Senator Mitchell was the university's chancellor between 1999 and 2009, and the Senator George J. Mitchell Institute for Global Peace, Security and Justice takes its name and also its inspiration from him. For his work in Northern Ireland, Senator Mitchell was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the Truman Institute Peace Prize, and the United Nations UNESCO Peace Prize. And so, to deliver our keynote address this morning, please give a very warm welcome to Senator George J. Mitchell. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your warm reception, for your presence here today. My thanks to Professor English for his very generous introduction. Uh, I want to begin by thanking many of those who have had a hand in this event, Queen's University and its Vice Chancellor Ian Green the University of Chicago and its president, Robert Zimmer, the Pearson Institute at the University of Chicago, headed by James Robinson, the Mitchell Institute here at Queens, headed by Hastings Dunnan, Brian Tierney and his team who helped organize this and other events over this weekend. I'm very grateful to all of them uh, and as I said to you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for being here. I'm going to talk a little bit later in some detail about the current situation in Northern Ireland, uh, but I want to begin by describing an interview I did yesterday on my arrival uh, from New York. The first question I was asked by a reporter was, uh, what do you think of all of this dysfunction in Northern Ireland. Isn't it terrible? Political dysfunction. And I said, well, I just got off the plane from the United States. <laughs> and as an American, I don't feel particularly well qualified to lecture to anybody else about political dysfunction. And it so happened that the next person to be interviewed, be interviewed was from London. And I said, and then these guys from the UK have also got the same uh, issues. So while the issues are very serious, and I will talk about them in a moment, uh, uh, let's not hold Northern Ireland to a standard higher than that we apply to other political entities, in particular the United States and the United Kingdom. Uh, I just flew over from uh, the United States where it's been a very hot summer. And on the flight over, I was reminded uh, of another very hot summer in North America. Uh, 231 years ago, in 1787, when 45 American colonial leaders met, and the product of their debate and deliberation was the American Constitution. The part of it that we Americans call the Bill of Rights is a concise and eloquent statement of the right of every individual to be free from oppression by government. That's one critical side of the coin of liberty. The other is the need for everyone to have a fair chance to enjoy the blessings of liberty. But to a man without a job, to a woman who can't get good care or education for her child, to the young people who lack the skills needed to compete 
in a world of technology, they don't think much about things like liberty or justice. They worry about coping day to day, about surviving. The same is true of people living in a society deeply afflicted by violence. Without civil order, without physical security, freedom and individual liberty be like become to be seen as mere concepts unrelated to the daily struggle to survive. So it was for a long time in Northern Ireland. Violence and fear settled over this beautiful land like a heavy, unyielding fog. The conflict hurt the economy. Unemployment rose in a deadly negative cycle. After a half century of cold relations and only occasional cooperation, the British and Irish governments concluded that if there was to be any hope of bringing the conflict to an end, they would have to cooperate in a sustained effort to lay the foundation for meaningful negotiation. The real heroes of the process that followed over several years were the people of Northern Ireland and their political leaders. The people supported the effort to reach agreement and they then voted overwhelmingly to ratify it. The political leaders in dangerous and difficult circumstances, after lifetimes devoted to conflict, summoned extraordinary courage and vision to reach agreement, often at great risk to themselves, their families, their political careers. Several of them and other key participants are here today and I want to ask them to stand and ask you to join me in expressing our gratitude for their strong and courageous leadership. They include Lord Trimble, who is here with his wife Daphne, the Taoiseach, Bertie Ahern, Monica McWilliams, Mark Durkin, David Donahue, I know Gary Donegan and Harold Good are here also, and there may be others who I haven't seen, but I'd ask all of those who played a role in that effort to please stand and ask all of you to join me in expressing our gratitude. To you. One leader who cannot be here because he is gravely ill, but who I think we ought to mention is John Hume, who was an architect and a crucial figure in the process. I ask everyone to bow their heads for a few seconds in a prayer for John's good health. Along the way, these men and women would be the first to acknowledge that they had a lot of help. The Good Friday Agreement of 1998, also known as the Belfast Agreement, was preceded by the Anglo-Irish Agreement of 1985 and the Downing Street Declaration of 1993. Despite much difficulty over many setbacks, the governments set the course and they persevered. For that, they deserve more credit than they've received. Bertie Ahern and Tony Blair were the prime ministers who brought the process to conclusion through skilled and determined leadership. But they would be the first to acknowledge that their predecessors helped to set the stage. They included John Major, Albert Reynolds, and John Bruton. After years of effort, the British and Irish governments were able to get peace negotiations underway in June of 1996. The Prime Ministers invited me to serve as chairman along with two great colleagues, former Prime Minister of Finland, Harry Hokery, 
and the former chairman of the Canadian General Staff, General John de Chastelet. By that time, I had been in Northern Ireland for a year and a half and long enough to realize what a daunting task it was. The negotiations that followed were the longest, most difficult I've ever been involved with, but somehow we kept going. There was an especially bleak and dangerous time in the Christmas season of 1997 and the early months of 1998. In mid-December, after 18 months of negotiations with virtually no progress, we tried to get an agreement on a statement defining the issues, not resolving the issues, just defining the issues. Despite intense effort, it was not possible to get even that limited agreement, and I remember thinking to myself, if they can't even agree on the definition of what the problems are, how will they ever be able to agree on the solutions to those problems. We adjourned for the Christmas holiday, discouraged and filled with doubt. Two days after Christmas, December 27, 1997, a prominent loyalist paramilitary leader was murdered in prison. That touched off a sharp increase in sectarian killings as a cycle of revenge took hold. In an effort to generate some progress, the governments had decided to move the negotiations from Stormont to London in January and to Dublin in February of 1998. But the London meeting was largely taken up with the expulsion of one of the parties. We never addressed the issues. And the Dublin meeting was taken up by the expulsion of another party. The process was obviously moving backward and the ceasefires were unraveling. It was in mid-February on a flight from Dublin back to New York that I decided to try to establish an early deadline for the end of the talks. I was convinced that the absence of a deadline guaranteed failure. The existence of a deadline couldn't guarantee success, but made it possible. It took a month for all of us working together put a plan in place and to get all of the parties, there were then eight political parties and two governments to agree. By late March, we were ready and the parties all agreed to a final deadline of midnight Thursday, April 9th. It was obvious they wanted to reach an agreement. They recognized that there had to be a deadline to force a decision. As we neared the deadline, there were nonstop negotiations. In a tight time frame, a powerful focus was brought to bear, and it ended up producing the right result. But the very fact that getting an agreement took such extraordinary effort was a warning signal of the difficulties that would follow as the agreement was being implemented. Finally, in the late afternoon, of April 10th, an agreement was reached. It's important to recognize that the agreement did not by itself guarantee a durable peace or political stability or genuine reconciliation. It made them possible. But everyone involved knew that there would have to be a lot of effort in good faith over a long period of time to achieve those goals and that remains true today. The agreement required the use of exclusively democratic and peaceful means to resolve differences, and it committed all of the parties to the total disarmament of paramilitary organizations. It stressed the need for mutual respect and tolerance between communities. It was based on the principle that the future of Northern Ireland should be decided by the people of Northern Ireland. It included constitutional change in Ireland and in the United Kingdom. It created new democratic institutions to provide self-governance in Northern Ireland and to encourage cooperation between the North and the South 
when it was in their mutual benefit. The agreement was overwhelmingly approved by the people of Ireland, North and South, in a free and democratic election. In what was then the first all-island vote in 80 years, 71% of the voters in the North and 95% of the voters in the South voted for the agreement. I've often been asked what lessons Northern Ireland holds for other conflicts. In considering that question, which I now will do, I begin by urging caution. No two conflicts are the same. Much as we would like it, there is no magic formula which, once discovered, can be used to end all conflicts. But there are basic principles which arise out of the experience in Northern Ireland that I believe are universal. They're simple, but necessary. First, I believe there's no such thing as a conflict that can't be ended. Conflicts are created and sustained by human beings, and they can be ended by human beings. No matter how ancient the conflict, no matter how hurtful, no matter how hateful, peace can prevail. When I arrived in Northern Ireland, I found, to my dismay, a widespread feeling of pessimism among the public and the political leaders. Every day, people stop me and my colleagues on the street, in the airport, in a restaurant, in a hotel lobby, they always began with kind words. Thank you. We appreciate what you're trying to do. But they always ended with despair. You're wasting your time. This conflict can't be ended. Within the limits of my position, I worked to reverse such attitudes, but this is the special responsibility of political leaders. It, the public in democracies often takes their cue from their political leaders, and leaders must lead. One way is to create an attitude of potential success, the belief that problems can be solved, that things can be better, not in a foolish or unrealistic way, but in a way that creates hope and confidence among the people. The second need is for a clear and determined policy not to yield to violence. Over and over, there were some here who tried to defeat the process of peace in Northern Ireland. But to succumb to the temptation to retaliate in kind would have given them what they wanted, escalating sectarian violence and an end to the process. So there had to be an endless supply of patience and perseverance. Sometimes in life, the mountains seem so high and the river so wide that it's hard to continue the journey. But no matter how bleak the outlook, the search for peace must go on. Seeking an end to conflict is not for the timid or for the tentative. It takes courage, perseverance, and steady nerves in the face of horrific violence. I believe it a mistake to say in advance that if acts of violence occur, negotiations will stop, because that's an individual to those who use violence to achieve their goals. A third need, so simple to say, so hard to achieve, is a willingness to compromise. Peace and political stability cannot be achieved in sharply divided societies unless there is a genuine willingness of leaders to understand the other point of view and to enter into principled compromise. As I said, it's easy for me to say these words, but in real life, it's very hard to accomplish because, in part, it requires of political leaders that they take risks for peace. Most political leaders dislike risk-taking. Many get to be leaders by avoiding or minimizing risk. So to ask them in the most difficult and dangerous circumstances to act boldly is to ask much. 
but it must be asked and they must respond if there is to be any hope for peace. I know it can be done because I saw it firsthand here in Northern Ireland. Men and women, some of whom had never before met, never before spoken, who had spent their entire lives in conflict, came together in an agreement for peace. Admittedly, it was long and difficult, but it did happen. And if it happened here, it can happen elsewhere. A fourth principle is to recognize at the outset that implementation of an agreement is as important as reaching it and often more difficult. That now is self-evident in Northern Ireland. There is now in Northern Ireland once again a stalemate and once again strong and courageous political leadership is necessary. Courage and commitment are required to get over this latest hurdle, but it can be done, and I sincerely believe that it will be done. I urge the current political leaders here in Northern Ireland and of the governments in the UK and Ireland to summon the courage and the vision that their predecessors demonstrated in 1998. It will be an immense tragedy for the process to fail now after 20 years. The political leaders and the people of Northern Ireland have come too far to risk letting peace slip away. There's a final point that underlies conflict uh, that I think must be mentioned. I recall clearly my first day in Northern Ireland more than 23 years ago. I was taken to and saw for the first time the barrier which physically separates the communities here in Belfast. On that first morning, I met with nationalists on their side of what we call the peace line in the afternoon with unionists on their side. The most striking thing to me was that their messages, although they clearly had not been coordinated, were essentially the same. In Belfast, they both told me there was a high correlation between unemployment and violence. They told me that where men and women lack opportunity, are without hope, they are far more likely to take the path of violence. As I sat and listened to them, I thought that I could just as easily be in a large city in the United States, or in South Africa, or in the Middle East. Despair is the fuel for instability and for conflict everywhere in the world. Hope and opportunity are essential to peace and stability. Men and women everywhere need income to support their families, and they need the satisfaction of doing something worthwhile and meaningful in and with their lives. The conflict in Northern Ireland obviously was not exclusively or even primarily economic. It involved religion, national identity, disputes over territory. The agreement acknowledged the legitimacy of the aspirations of both communities and it created the economic, the possibility that economic prosperity would flow from and contribute in itself to a lasting peace. I want to close on a personal note. The agreement was reached on April 10, 1998 and ratified on May 22. Less than three months later, on August 15, at Oma, a huge bomb blast shattered the calm of a warm summer afternoon. 29 people died, over 300 were injured. Amidst the death and the destruction that was laid bare the utter senselessness of trying to solve the political problems of Northern Ireland by violence. A few days later, I accompanied President Clinton to Oma to meet with survivors and relatives of the dead. 
Hundreds of people were present, many of whom I spoke with on a long and memorable evening. All were unforgettable. I will mention just two of them. Claire Gallagher was 15 years old, tall and lovely, an aspiring pianist. In the blast, she lost both of her eyes. As we spoke, she sat with deep red scars lining her face and two large white patches where her eyes had been, an exemplar of grace and courage. Michael Monahan was 33 years old. He lost his wife, who was pregnant, his wife's mother, and he and his wife's 18-month-old daughter. Three generations of women killed in a single incident. A senseless moment. Michael was left with three children under the age of five. Despite their terrible, irreparable loss, both Claire and Michael spent their time with me, talking not about themselves, but urging that the peace process go forward and that I continue my efforts. Their courage gave me hope. Their determination gave me resolve. They represented what I believe to be the spirit of the people of Northern Ireland. I'm not objective. I'm deeply biased in favor of the people of Northern Ireland. Having spent many years among them, I've come to love and admire them and this place. While they can be quarrelsome, too quick to take offense, they also are warm, generous, energetic, and productive. They've made mistakes, as we all have, but they're learning from them. They've learned that violence won't solve their problems, that unionists and nationalists have more in common than they have differences, that knowledge of their history is a good thing, but being chained to the past is not. There have been many setbacks along the way, and there will be more, but I hope the direction for Northern Ireland was set firmly and irrevocably when the people approved overwhelmingly in referendum the agreement. We're all proud of how far you've come in 20 years. And while there's still a way to go, I hope these discussions will in some way help to reignite the will to work together for a peaceful and a prosperous Northern Ireland. The Northern Ireland of today is unrecognizable from the Northern Ireland that I came to 23 years ago. It has problems, yes, as do all human societies, but it is largely peaceful and growing toward broadly shared prosperity. I am, Ameri I am an American and I'm proud of it, but a large part of my heart and of my emotions will forever be with the people of Northern Ireland. May God bless them with peace, reconciliation, and prosperity. Thank you all very much for being here. Ladies and gentlemen, can I just thank Queen's University, University of Chicago, the Mitchell Institute and the Pearson Institute uh, for asking me to play a part in this wonderful keynote event today. Um, 
My name is Yvette Shapiro. I've been a journalist in Northern Ireland for over 30 years. And during that time, the people beside me here on the platform have been towering figures in the story that I've had the privilege of covering and, and reporting. Um, sometimes I have waited along with colleagues in the dark, in the rain, in the cold, on a drafty doorstep, hoping that some of these people might emerge from the rooms in which they're having their talks, their negotiations and their attempts to bring peace, hoping that they'll come out and share with us the progress um, of that torturous process that Senator Mitchell uh, just shared with us. Um, and all of them throughout that process were extremely generous with their time. Um, sometimes, of course, they weren't able to talk. They had to flee into the night to another extremely important meeting. Um, so for me, it's a wonderful opportunity. They can't escape today. So they're with us for the next hour and they're going to give us uh, some very personal uh, and some very important insights uh, to the peacemaking that all of them were involved in. Let me just introduce our panel to you. At the end, Lord Trimble, former First Minister of Northern Ireland and former leader of the Ulster Unionist Party. Next, Professor Monica McWilliams, co-founder of the Northern Ireland Women's Coalition, Chief Commissioner of the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission, and uh, Emeritus Professor of the Transitional Justice Institute at Ulster University. The Reverend Dr. Harold Good was a witness to the decommissioning of paramilitary arms. He is the recipient of the World Methodist Peace Award in 2007. Father Gary Donegan was talks chair of the North Belfast Community Resolution Panel and a director of peace and reconciliation for the Passionist Order. And beside me, Bertie Ahern, the former Taoiseach of Ireland between 1997 and 2008. Please, a very warm welcome for our panel. David Trimble, I'm going to start with you. George Mitchell told us that when he arrived in Northern Ireland, he found pessimism and despair um, among the members of the public that he spoke to. Um, what were the circumstances that were existing at the time from your point of view as a political leader? And how did you overcome that sense of, of despair that must have been not just amongst the public, but also perhaps uh, amongst political leaders? Well. One has to say at the outset that uh, the, when the members of the public expressed their pessimism to George, they had good grounds for pessimism. Because what they were saying at those times, by looking back from the beginning of the Troubles in the late 60s, right up to the, the mid 90s, that nothing, that various attempts had been made uh, to reach agreement and all had failed. And from the point of view of the man in the street, looking at the situation where, you know, no matter how well-intentioned parties may be, the fact that they had never actually achieved an agreement, uh, it was, you know, that was the, the reality that we had to deal with. Uh, and it was a significant problem for us going through the, 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 the negotiations and immediately afterwards, is that you, that degree of pessimism re remained. And it took quite some time before it, 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 it was lifted. And, to some extent, it, it has returned again, uh, and we're going to have to deal with that again. Um, Professor McWilliams, the, the, the pessimism that, that Lord Trimble speaks of and that George Mitchell spoke of, um, it really was almost defeating any efforts um, to, to move forward with, with, with peace. How did you find that leaders like yourself were able to overcome that? How could you bring the people with you? Well, in concept and be pessimistic, but I think it was Confucius who said that you need to sit and you need to light a candle uh, rather than curse the darkness. Um, I'm not sure if everybody heard that. This is going in and out. Um, Confucius once said that you can sit and curse the darkness, or you can light the candle. And I think that we have sat and cursed the darkness for a long time. Um, how did I find the leaders? 
the other thing that George Smith was saying was the importance of leadership. Um, and it's leadership do not have to repeat the pessimism that people are feeling because that's repeating the politics of fear. And you need to start talking about the politics of hope. And what was different about peace agreement and the peace table was that everybody who had been party to the problem then started becoming party to the solution. Monica, we're just going to have your. Have to, yeah, this is. We just have your microphone looked. There we go. Yeah, yeah. Is that it's better? important that we hear this. Yeah. So, what was different was that, for the first time ever, the two governments were going to be at the table, both the British and Irish, and we couldn't have done it without that recognition of both of them. As um, Lord Trimble has said, there were many field rounds of negotiations. We recognised in the Women's Coalition the need for back channels to those parties that should come to the table but weren't present um, that because the IRA had not reinstated their ceasefire. And we were accused at that time of talking to terrorists, um, but as it turned out, it was much needed. Uh, when people are in trouble, you reach out. It's not always about celebrating the successes. And that's the message for today, that I desperately think we need back channels. We need people to see the humanity and the other person first, to build that relationship first. That was difficult at the talks table. People took great pride in saying, I've never spoken to that crowd across there, and I never will. Well, that's not good if you're going to negotiate your own interest as well as understand their interests. That's a basic lesson of negotiations. So in the absence of that, you need facilitation and you need mediation. And we didn't have much of that other than through George Mitchell and Harry Holkry and General Tchaslin. Um, and that was, I think, a mistake because there were so many rumours and so many lies flying around the room that we should have taken time out and introduced people who could mediate. Now, we took on that, some of that role, but we were not that skilled. We had to learn it. But at least people on all sides were talking to us. And I said often that we used to bring the loyalist parties to our homes because they were strangers to us and sit down and talk and find out what was their interest in being at the table. So my message really is, in order to break down pessimism, you start talking, you get into a dialogue with people who are your enemies, people who are your strangers, people you don't know, um, and find the humanity. And then perhaps you'll get to each other's interests. So just, you know, we can't be overcome at this time in Northern Ireland by pessimism any more than we were in the past. I mean, all of us suffer tragedies. There's probably many people sitting in this room today who have been terribly injured, terribly harmed. And they, more than anyone, I've seen it myself in Northern Ireland, are prepared to reach out so that we never go back. Um, and that's the lesson from our anniversary of OMA, which Harold Good spoke so beautifully about last week. And I think it's the message for now. We can't afford to drown ourselves in pessimism. Um, we have a problem, but there is a solution. And it's about time we got to it. Can I just ask you, Bertie Ahern, Senator Mitchell did pay tribute to predecessors of, of, of politicians that, that you were working with. He, he, he talked about um, Albert Reynolds and John Bruton and the, the roles that, that others have played. Whenever you t tried to, to bring this forward, to move this towards a settlement, how did you manage to overcome the problems that previous leaders had not been able to overcome, to actually reach the final point? I think as <coughs> David said that I could this was one of the, the hard things because people kind of believed that there wasn't a solution. And as George said, the first thing people said to him, they were nice to him and then said, well, there's not a solution. But I think the big thing in any conflict, in any negotiation, are the people on the other side of the table or all sides of the table, are they really interested in trying to find a solution? Did they, do they really want to, to find a way forward? And I, I think re regardless of the fact that the personalities were, were different, the attitudes and the policies were different, um, I was struck 
very I was involved in with Albert in the down the street declaration and you know the, the, the ceasefire period I was Minister of Finance in that period but it always struck me that you know given a fair wind that people genuinely wanted to, to try and find a solution and they wanted to engage with each other and then of course the, the, the and you build up relationships you, you get on with, with, with people and I think that was fairly well I mean the thing that struck me but it's not unusual um, in the early meetings was that people seemed very nice people to me. The trouble was when they were all together, they didn't seem very nice to each other. Um, but you know that's that's life. Um, I had been involved in trade union negotiations where we, we would negotiate with one union because the well, one union wouldn't get on with the other union. So it, it, it's 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 not rocket science. But I think when people genuinely wanted to see an end to violence, uh, they wanted to be helpful. They wanted to find solutions. And the whole thing about any negotiation, you're talking about a lot of them for the next few days, but if people are, they want a fair solution, they do not want to be hoodwinkled, they do not want to be conned, they do not want to sign up something that they, is against their beliefs, and it has to be fair, it has to be equitable. And I, I think that was the, the great success. There were very good people who were prepared uh, to, to work through difficult times to come to a solution, and then to make big moves and you know, people have to make big moves. Uh, the governments did, and the parties did, and the party leaders did. And there weren't easy moves. There weren't easy moves to carry everybody with you. Sometimes impossible. Uh, but in, in the interests of peace and stability and security, people made those big moves. And I have huge admiration for uh, the people that you know, I, I dealt with 20 years ago and the people that were involved afterwards trying to implement it. Um, I always remember George warned us that day in the 10th of April. You know, he said, it's one, it's one thing to negotiate, it's another thing to implement it. And I think a lot of us here know, know what that meant. 10 years later, we were all about greyer and older. But anyway, um, I think really the people were good and they were strong and they wanted to make progress and they stuck with it. And I think that was the real good thing about this evening. Lord Trimble, you want to come in on that? Yes, um, George mentioned the the Downing Street Declaration of December 1993. And that was actually hugely important because it was produced by the British and Irish government after consulting with the, the political parties and it set out the parameters of, of the talks and, and the key issues to be engaged in. From that was then spun out the, the Mitchell Principles of January uh, 94. Uh, which was dealing with the commitment to exclusively peaceful and democratic means and the need for all the parties to publicly commit themselves to that. So that was again prefiguring key elements of the agreement. Now I took the view at that time that what we needed was to get a mandate from the electorate on these issues and we had an election following that in 96 to elect people to a forum for political dialogue. Uh, and that election had a rather unusual uh, provision as to uh, the, 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 the operation of the election, who could be elected. It was formed in such a way uh, that all the parties had some representation in it. We didn't have the normal British uh, proposal for, for procedures for election, but we had one that was much more comprehensive. And that meant then that every significant element in Northern Ireland society was part of that process, both in terms of the forum and then the formal negotiations then spread, came out, out of that. So you had actually a very long and very careful preparation, which in many respects prefigured what was in the agreement. And I think that was also that was hugely important in getting the large endorsement that there was for the agreement in the referenda. In, in, in 98. So the, the process contained no surprises. It was carefully planned and developed, and developed, yes, with the support of the governments, but crucially with the involvement of all shades of opinion in Northern Ireland. Uh, and that, I think, gives to the Belfast Agreement it, its particular authority. Father Donegan, um, I read an interview with you recently um, where you said, Sometimes you have to say the really hard things and make the big gestures. 
Um, you've done that personally. Everybody on this panel has done that. How important was that in bringing about the peace? Saying the hard things, making the big gestures. I think that's always very important because um, look, we, we've witnessed many, many major uh, gestures uh, that brings hope. Um, one of the, the, the words that has resonated here on the, on the podium and, and on the, the, the platform here today is the word hope. Um, I use the analogy uh, of going to wedding receptions, right? And uh, you go to a wedding reception and other fellow clerics here will attest to this. You're stuck at the top table and maybe you're beside the father of the bride. And he's very anxious because he's beside the priest. So he kind of starts rocking back and forward. <laughs> and he kind of feels he has to say negative things. So he goes, oh, the world's an awful place, Father, isn't it? <laughs> oh, the youth today. God help Ireland. And you're going, well, if they got through with you, they get through with anyone. You know, <laughs> the kind of people who, you know, at Christmas time, they would say, oh, Christmas. It used to snow at Christmas. <laughs> and then if it does snow, they go, oh, snow, that's all we need now. <laughs> so in a sense, hope is the thing. And, and, what, and where did I see that? I saw that in the panelists here. I saw them rising above what was their, their natural comfort zone. I saw not just leadership, this place today is falling over with leaders. I mean, we have some of the great leaders. The problem is, is missing statesmanship, and that's the difference. And even out of uh, adversity, um, I'm sitting beside Verdi, a person I have uh, tremendous admiration for. Um, but one thing um, is grief, and that has been a common theme right throughout this. And we get one mother, our mammy, as it were. And he left his own mother's wake to come forward, to hear, to be part of that. And when you saw the tears in his eyes at the time, despite feeling for him at a personal level and his loss, what I saw was hope. Because if people like him were prepared to make that kind of sacrifice, and when I, you know, Monica and Lord Trimble, and then in the implementation of it, the people like Harold, like Alec Reed, and that, in a sense, it becomes infectious. So that it, it's, it's about, you know, so much today of even the work that I do is stopping radicalization of young minds, of untruths being told of what actually happened before, of finding out of the people who were directly involved what was the cost of that and the cost that is now and telling that to young people. So in a sense, it's about, it's about using the examples of people who it wasn't just their words, it was their actions, it was their commitments. When I was privileged enough to be a guest here uh, at the, the 20th anniversary and I looked up and I saw the people on the stage and I thought every single one of them, the statesmanship and the hope and hope is infectious, and that's why I think that, that Senator Mitchell talked about it. And when you think of when you think of him, when you think of him bending beside his child in America, thinking, "All, oh, how can I work with these people? God, they can't even agree on what they disagree about, and how can we get solutions to that?" And he made a promise to his child and said, "I am not going to. I am not going to let this falter." I will give everything to it, which he did, and we are so uh, 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 indebted to people like him, uh, and in a sense is, uh, we cannot allow that to slip. There's that incredible movie, you know, Any Given Sunday, and in it Al Pacino, he, he delivers the message inch by inch, the story inch by inch. We won the piece here, inch by inch. That's how precious it is. So. There are people, and many of the people who are actually here uh, today uh, as the audience or for their participants, we are not going to let those inches slip because we are people of hope. Thank you. Um, 
Karen Good referenced it at the introduction that you were a witness to paramilitary decommissioning um, and you're also a church leader and a, and a community leader how important was it for you know for you to be able to bring people along with you because a lot of people must have come to you who were probably suffering the grief that, that Gary has talked about of personal loss sometimes multiple personal loss within their families throughout the conflict and how did you manage to convince people that we were on the right path and this was something that, that you know you you could recommend to people to support I think we um, by the way just a, a little aside when Gary was talking about the despair and despondency there's a word that I think we should eliminate from the English language and that's the word but because we qualify everything here with but <laughs> you know we've had a lovely summer uh, but you know, the forecast for the winter is pretty miserable uh, you know and everything we said we, we tend to qualify it with the word but you know we, we made a good agreement but you know and so let's be careful how we use the word but um, your question about how do we bring people along I think one of the things we've got to remember is that uh, we are where we are because we realized we couldn't exclude people we needed to include one another we have a history a dreadful history of wanting to find ways of excluding each other and we can exclude each other in different ways. We can exclude people because uh, they don't subscribe to our political or religious or other ideology and therefore we avoid them and we shun them and we keep them out of our conversations etc etc. We also can exclude people through insensitivity and you're talking about you know the hurting people, the grieving people, the victims. We need to be incredibly sensitive it's very easy to say you know if only those people would move on if only those people would just forget it um, you know come on and very very easy let's draw a line very easy particularly if you haven't suffered a grievous personal loss oneself so one has to be very very sensitive and to bring people along I think the blame game uh, has never helped. Um, blaming this group, that group, <coughs> the other group. And so what some of us tried to do was to create a culture of understanding and listening and sitting alongside people who had very different points of view and positions and come from different directions people whose hurt and pain was making it very difficult for them to be a part of a peace process and still is for many of them and we have to be hugely sensitive to that rather than lecturing them and demanding from them etc 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 I always think there are three words that I uh, I commend to people in a peace process and they are three T's talk truth and trust one leads to the other somebody said to me there's a fourth T that you didn't mention and uh, that becomes I very often say in public when I'm introduced as this great peacemaker I say look I'm embarrassed by that kind of <laughs> introduction actually what I am is a tea maker um, and that has been I think a very important part of the work that many of us have done you've referred to it Monica bringing people to your home um, people who otherwise you would not normally uh, find common ground with or people who wouldn't find it easy to talk with each other and I don't know how many gallons of tea uh, we have poured in my home, in monasteries, and parsonages, and different places. Uh, but they've all been very, very important. So it's talk and truth and trust and, uh, and tea. Um, and uh, 
I said that one day publicly somewhere, and one of my sons was sitting in the audience, and he pulled me aside afterwards, and he said, come on, Dad, you know, Mum made the tea, you just poured it. Uh, but you know what I'm saying? Creating opportunities where you can be. I, had, uh, I said something not long ago publicly, and uh, I felt I was misunderstood and misinterpreted by one of the leading victims group campaigners. And he went public with a, uh, a strong uh, criticism um, and condemnation of what I'd said. Um, and I was asked, what are you going to say back to him? <laughs> and I said, I, I, I'll invite him for tea. And we did. And he brought one or two people with him who were equally aggrieved. We ended up by praying together. Um, and uh, just being human one to the other and building trust through talking. And without that trust, we go nowhere. I just uh, last night, somebody who knew I was coming here today uh, said to me, you know, they, and they'd taken a photograph of a mural on a wall in East Belfast. And uh, it, uh, it's quite a, uh, a, a very large mural. <laughs> and uh, it says, peace cannot be kept by force. It can only be achieved by understanding. And that's in the heart of Loyalist East Belfast. And I don't know who painted it, but I can only believe it was from a Loyalist brush. Monica McWilliams, did you have a vision of what the peace was going to look like after the agreement had been signed? And has that vision for what the peace should be, has, has that been upheld? Have we, have we wandered away from the, the path of it? Or have, have we a process that's still true to the vision that, that you and others had? I suppose everybody at the table had some hope and some vision. Um, but if you had asked us back then, did we all agree on it? The answer would have been no. I think it was President Mandela said the same as what George Mitchell had said to us, you know, what's the cause of your problem? Well, if you have 48 different answers to that question, you have 48 different visions of how you're going to come out of it. And so we focused more on our interests, um, not on our wants, because everybody had loads of wants and they weren't going to get it. So right down to the very last few days, we had to focus on our interests. But what did peace mean? Well, it actually meant that we had to stop the violence. So that was the first thing, that nobody wanted a reoccurrence of that. But is it a negative peace? Yes, we don't have uh, the violence. I am able to say to my children as they were growing up then afterwards, that they were gonna live a much safer life than I had lived. And that turned out to be the case. But is it a positive piece? Has the hate speech stopped? Has um, the attitudes towards the other side stopped and changed? And that's what we knew was going to take much longer. I mean, my own son said to me the night I came back from the Good Friday Agreement and walked up the street, and one of them said he was on the skateboard, and he said, uh, I said, we've actually reached peace today. And he said, ah, ma'am, you've been saying that for years. Surely isn't that what you're supposed to be doing? And I thought, well, that's reality. Walked into the house and the older fella said, um, I see there's been an agreement. It was all over the TV. And I said, yeah. And he said, does that mean all the killing will stop? And I said, well, actually, we have to be very careful because people will send us a message very quickly after this agreement, like domestic violence, which I work on, to say that if I can't have you, nobody else is going to. And they could set off a bomb. And it truly did happen a month later and a few months later in Oma. And he said, oh, right, so does it mean the issue of parades will be resolved? And will the riots stop? I said, no, no that's going to take it some time, son. And then he turned to me and he said, well, what does it mean? And that's when reality hit. It didn't just hit when George Mitchell said to us, go home now. You've signed an agreement and the hard work starts today. I remember him saying that. And certainly that was reality. But he said something today which was true, Yvette, which was it was the implementation which was the hardest bit. Um, I think Lord Trimble is absolutely right that there was a lot of preparation went into that agreement. 
um, and it was very important it did and it became inclusive and the substance became comprehensive. Those are two lessons that are really important for us and for Colombia. Um, but the final piece was how do you enforce what you have agreed? How do you really put the promises into place? And over 20 years later, we're still doing that. Tim O'Connor is here, who's a commissioner with me on the Independent Reporting Commission for the disbandment of paramilitaries. Well, why would Tim, myself, Mitchell Reese for the United States and John McBurney from Northern Ireland, like myself, be asked to sit in such a commission for the next four years by the two governments and the Northern Ireland Executive. It's because we still got this fear of gangsters and criminals running around our streets with coercive power. And that has to stop. And that's why people are saying, you know, what difference did it make? Well, it, it has, but we will have to stop that and get through that. There is no time in Northern Ireland anymore for armed groups and who are using their affiliations to threaten the rest of us. Um, so, but the positive piece, that means our kids need to be able to go to school together, to share a space together. That's starting, but it should have gone much further. It does mean the walls have to come down. It does mean that our shared housing needs to work. I am furious that when those poor people were put out in the bottom of the Raven Hill Road last year, that civil society should have come out and stood up, but I was more annoyed at the fact that the police served them with eviction notices rather than saying, we will stand by you and protect you to share this space with your neighbours. Now, that has to change and we've got to get back to the community policing that we once had um, and to protect those neighbours so they can share this place that we call home. That, to me, is positive peace and that was my vision. Ahern, just, just picking up on that, um, the, the vision that you had when you reached the agreement of how, how the next few years were going to, to work out for Northern Ireland, um, you, did, did you have a, a time scale in mind for when some of these other key issues might be resolved? Um, and are you surprised that some of the issues that Monica has, has spoken about are still really infecting our society here? Well, I think we look back 20 years now, which is a, is a long time. Uh, a long time, and I suppose the, uh, the one thing we all hoped um, when we talked about the Friday of the 10th of April 1998 was that we'd see peace and that we'd see sustainable peace uh, into the, not just the short term, but the long term, uh, and I think we've seen, we, we've seen that fairly well. Uh, some, some problems, but when I, I see my own city and the amount of problems that arise out of gang warfare and drug-related crime, uh, I think Northern Ireland has been a, a very peaceful place. But the great success, I think, of, of what we did 20 years ago was to take on so many big issues. Uh, some of them took a long time, decommissioning of arms it took too long. But uh, dealing with the prisoners issue, dealing with the reform uh, of, of the policing, huge issue, uh, dealing with criminal justice system, the equality issues, trying to involve civic society, you know, build up the economy in Northern Ireland. I mean, they, they, they have been enormously successful. The amount of tourists, and I've been up here a good bit this summer, the amount of tourists ar ar around Northern Ireland. They, I think that's all fantastic. Um, and I think the institutions were working fairly well. I think that was good. Um, it's beyond me, but how the present group of politicians, and I I want to make it important by that. I think one of our great successes is that we had an inclusive process. It was, we didn't all agree on everything, but it was inclusive. Like, when you include the governments, there were 10 groupings. And um, we were trying to deal with the end of uh, paramilitary act activity, and we're trying to build in civic society, the work Monica was doing, which was trade unions. Uh, it was pulling everything together. And now people seem to think that the solution is the two parties should get around the place and, and salt it all out. And now we're 20 months on and that hasn't happened. So, you know, I, I, I don't get it um, why people, and I'm certainly not happy, that the basic institutions that relate to uh, what grants can be paid to people, whether they're community groups, sporting groups, industrial groups, uh, all the decisions that are sitting in, in the offices of a group of civil servants who are doing their very best to keep things going, how anyone can be happy 
uh, who was elected. I don't think anybody stood in the last election in Northern Ireland. Maybe I missed it. Maybe some of my colleagues can tell me. But I don't think anyone stood on the basis that um, they're not going to be involved in anything for the next few years. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't remember that ad, in, 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 and I don't remember that party political broadcast saying, I want to be elected, I want me money, I want the expenses, but I don't want to do anything. Um, now, if they did, maybe they would have got elected, but I don't think so. So, you know, I honestly, honestly think, you ask me a straight question, I'll give you a straight answer. Until I see the institutions back up and running, and people elected for office, get on with the day-to-day -day things of Northern Ireland, which are the bread and butter issues that communities want. If, you, if, if our generation, collectively, uh, with all of the help from churches, community groups, civic societies, everybody, including the political leadership, tough decisions that people like David had to, to make, and um, could deal with policing and decommissioning and criminal injustice, and the huge list of issues, what are that dealing with a few outstanding issues? And I think as soon as they come back from their holidays, and I hope they have a good time, it's a lovely summer, that they get on with it and give us all a break. Char characteristically direct uh, from Bertie Hearn. Lord Trimble, I know you want to come in here. a little bit because we, we had talked about how we created a process that was inclusive but actually during that process there were two elements that excluded them left the process uh, and one was the split that took place within the republican movement uh, when the, the leadership of the republican movement uh, endorsed the Mitchell principles and came into the talks there was a splinter group that went off uh, and, and tried to restart violence, what we could now call distant Republicans. Now, over the years since then, uh, that element has, has been there, but has not managed to get any serious traction with the community as a whole, uh, and, and is petering out. The other element that walked out uh, in place at the crucial, or in, in the midst of the process was the Democratic Unionist Party led by Ian Paisley, uh, predicting that the process would fail uh, and when we had an agreement, uh, he and his party attacked that agreement uh, and ran for some year, period of time on, a, on an anti-agreement ticket. But that didn't work for them with the electorate. And they shifted their position to one which effectively was working, uh, endorsing the agreement. Uh, and that enabled them then to, to exploit some parts of the agreement that were not being implemented as they should have been and led to a shift of uh, electoral opinion. Uh, the DUP uh, endorsed the agreement of the, by taking office, uh, but the way in which they executed that agreement, that, that office, uh, hasn't helped to uh, increase stability. In fact, it, it is one of the factors for the instability that we've had recently. And you can also see a problem in the Republican movement, which in latter months has uh, sounded more as if it was going back to the slogans of 20, 25 years ago, uh, rather than to deal with the position that they the position as it is today. And so we have a problem going forward. Uh, and that is also aggravated by a, a bigger, pro another problem, I'm going to say almost a bigger problem, but one that extends outside of Northern Ireland and Ireland to deal with the British Isles as a whole and indeed with Europe. And it's the question of Brexit. Uh, and that is one of the reasons for the difficulties that we have at the moment. Uh, the, the Republicans have pulled out from Northern Ireland Assembly uh, because they hope to use the Brexit process to enhance their electoral position. And I, much as I would like to see uh, this government assembly up and running, I think the reality is that we're not going to see that happening this side uh, of the conclusion of Brexit, unless the government should take it into their, uh, their hands to actually put some real pressure on those who are not participating. Uh, unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be any stomach at the moment uh, in government either in Dublin or London to do that but I think we do have to seriously think are we going to allow uh, these what are minority parties to uh, hamper what the popular the, the electorate as a whole want uh, and I think I've, I can't give you an answer to that question but that question has to be posed uh, because 
uh, if there is no pressure coming from London and, and Dublin, then the parties that are holding us to ransom at the moment will continue to do so. Harold Good, how, how can we overcome this problem where some people seem to perhaps be taking the achievement of, of the Good Friday Agreement for granted, as if the, the peace has been won, it's something from the past, it's not something that's, that's really still living with us. How, how, do, we, how do we get that hope sorry, back so sorry, into the process? I, uh, there's a difficulty, I think, for some of us at this end, hearing your oh. question. Could you just put yes, it in I'm a, just, sen I'm in just a saying, sentence? Do you think there's a problem that some people, many people, have taken the Good Friday Agreement now for granted? Um, and that they don't recognise the enormous achievement that that was, and perhaps in, in, the, in that way the hope has started to slip again. And how can we rebuild that, yeah. particularly coming from civic society? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, I think um, there is a complacency. It's a complacency can be very dangerous because we leave a vacuum. And as David Trimble has said, there is always the, and Monica, it's always the, uh, the danger, and it is a very real danger, that there are those who are all too anxious to fill that vacuum. And so complacency can be very, very dangerous. Um, I think we have taken it, and did take it for granted. Um, the overwhelming vote for the Good Friday Agreement, which was fantastic. Uh, and again, the genius of the agreement was, and I say this when I go to other places, no agreement will ever be worth it unless it is embraced and endorsed by the people. It must be a people's agreement, and that was the strength of our agreement. And so time has gone by, and another generation has come. I mean, there are people now who weren't even born uh, who are thinking young people. Um, and the... Uh, there's just a kind of a, well, we have an agreement, so you know, what's the problem? And uh, it's been said over and over again and will continue to be said and must be said, implementation, implementation, implementation. That's the key word we've got to think about. We've, we can implement the wording and we can implement the paragraphs and we can implement the, you know, I was by, but unless we implement the spirit of the agreement, that I think is what is missing as well the spirit of the agreement. I think most of us who are for, on this platform and others of our, of our age group uh, can remember the, the excitement of uh, the announcement uh, on that Good Friday. I remember very well that uh, it was Good Friday and I remember I was to preach that evening uh, and I scrapped the sermon that I had prepared and, uh, you know, because uh, there was a, a new feeling of hope and I remember linking the hill of Calvary to the hill at Stormont and uh, you know there was a new dawn going and there was a resurrection and you know all those themes and we all were excited about it and then you know that waned over a period of time and we've had all these hiccups and start stop start stop and so indifference and you know what I look around me and particularly in the better, more privileged economically and otherwise parts of our community, life is going on as normal. There's bread on the table, the buses are running, the pensions are being paid, the schools are open and we got four good results today from the GCSEs. So, you know, you know, do, do, uh, you know what, what's the problem? And we do need to realize that the absence of an elected representative taking responsibility for our governance is not only ineffectual and creating problems, there's a pile of problems piling up on those in trays in Stormont. And uh, we're only beginning now to, to see the thing. And until people generally feel the impact of the absence of an assembly, uh, I think we will continue to be, oh, well, sir, you know, people are more worried about the fact they're getting paid for doing nothing than they are about the fact they're doing nothing. And there is a difference. And I think it's time we, 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 we get back to the heart of it all. But please, please, please challenge indifference and complacency wherever we see it.
that, I think uh, one of the things we're here to look at is the connections between this conflict and other conflicts, particularly at Colombia. Um, and what I've learned, and many of us went to Colombia at their request uh, to talk about Northern Ireland, and Harold and I were there together at one stage, um, particularly with FARC, which was going to be so difficult to get a 50-year-old conflict involving masses of guerrillas. Unlike ours, they were a standing army. Um, ours came home every night, and so there are differences. But what was similar is that they did reach an agreement um, after many years in Cuba. And what I think I learned by being there during their referendum was that the people were confused about what was in that agreement, um, as they were here. Um, and so it was very easy for the no side to tell people what to be against, as it was here. And it was very hard for us to go out on the streets, as we did during those six weeks, to tell everybody the complexities of what we had just signed up to. Um, but the point that um, Harold has just made is building on the spirit. I compare it, as a woman I would, who has given birth to a child, of the hard labour that we had to go through and the pain, but then the satisfaction of seeing what we had almost, and we did give birth to something new, but we dropped it almost like an orphan. Any baby needs nurtured, any baby needs cared for. And there was a lot of courage shown by people taking risks at that stage that needed to be maintained. Um, and to stand up to those who either said no um, from a constitutional party point of view and to stand up to those who were going to use violence. And the only way to do that was to stand together. And that's the message for Colombia. I have re real fears that Colombia is going to go through some really bad times like we did. But as Harold said, take that spirit and move quickly. We moved far too slowly. We got over some of the most difficult issues quite quickly in terms of the patent reforms and policing, which we didn't imagine we would get to as quick as we did because we had good people on the policing board working together. We need to get back to that. We need to get back to people saying, this is what I think, what do you think, how can we get through this? Then the second thing for Colombia and for here was when we sign off on agreements, there are circumstances we can't anticipate and Brexit is one of them. And this has really unsettled all of us. It's not a person in this hall who will have um, a, an opinion that is similar maybe to the person sitting next to them. I certainly don't share Lord Trimble's opinion because I think yours is that we should leave and mine is that we should remain. Yeah, well, that's the decision. Article 50 was triggered without Northern Ireland being consulted. Parliament wasn't consulted, Scotland wasn't consulted, we weren't consulted. That is a constitutional issue that when I signed the agreement, any change in the status of Northern Ireland's constitution would be discussed with the people of Northern Ireland and built by consensus. The only referendum I remember was the referendum that the people went to in which we won by 71%. And that was by consensus in terms of how we would share this place and connect with this island and with the UK, but most importantly with Europe. Connection for, this for our people is everything. The billions that were poured in here by the European Union disappearing down the tube. The other day we just heard that two billion on construction is being stymied because civil servants can't make decisions in the absence of ministers. This is not good enough. But most importantly, it was my identity that I walked away from that table 20 years ago, safe in the knowledge that we could be British or Irish or both. And what is happening to us now? For that, the parties need to start getting round the table, get out of this uncertainty, share what they believe is the way forward and get on with it. Okay. Uh, just as a matter of fact, with regard to the European issue, there was a referendum. It was a United Kingdom referendum because it, in, it involved the United Kingdom as a whole. And that referendum voted to leave the European Union. That is the democratic position. And I'm happy to say that is being implemented. Uh, and the, uh, we will leave next March. And that is under European law. Uh, 
it would be much better, and I agree entirely with those who say that the Northern Ireland elected parties should be there. They should be in the assembly. They would then be part of the ministerial group that meets. There is a joint ministerial committee. It's UK wide. Uh, and until the uh, storm was uh, uh, collapsed uh, by Sinn Féin and DUP, those parties were part of the, minister, the joint ministerial committee that met on these issues. Can I, can I now, ask the government you, is also can I, consults with the parties. Can I ask, can I ask you, Lord Trimble, just to, just to pick up, I, I, I know we're, we're, we're talking a bit about Brexit, but just to, to bring it to the issue which has dominated a lot of the recent discussion, which is the impact of Brexit, the impact of a possible border poll, which perhaps may flow sometime after Brexit, on the, the agreement, on the Good Friday Agreement. Can you, can you bring those together for us? Because that is well, causing concern. The agreement itself contains definitions and provisions with regard to a border poll. Uh, and there, there, it is there enshrined in the agreement. Uh, and if the conditions set out in the agreement uh, are met, then there will be one. But there won't be one otherwise. And at the moment, those conditions uh, could not be met. Uh, and so talk about a border poll at the present time uh, is, is quite irrelevant to the situation we're in. Uh, with regard to, sorry, the... Does, does Brexit pose a threat to the agreement and no. to peace? No, not on any... Uh, th this is something that has been talked up as if it is a problem, and it's not a problem. Uh, if we could just get the parties concerned to sit around the table for half an hour, we'd solve it. Uh, but there again, uh, there are people in Brussels who are playing games with this and are holding back on discussing the matter uh, and trying to resolve the matter. Uh, but uh, it will happen, and it's not going to be a problem so far as Northern Ireland is concerned. There is going to be a certain difficulty with regard to the South, because it will now find uh, that it is, contains part of the European Union's external uh, borders. And under European law, uh, there will be an obligation on the Irish government to put in place appropriate uh, provisions to enforce their tariffs. Now, I, I, I emphasise European law and European tariffs. Uh, we would prefer not to have the European tariffs, uh, but they don't show Dublin, sorry, Brussels doesn't show any sign of being prepared to take those issues on board. It could be, and very probably will be, that all these difficult issues that are, are largely caused, or partly if not entirely caused by Brussels, will all be resolved at the last minute, because that's the way the European Union conducts its business. It spends a lot of time slowly going around all 27 members, getting the various positions and all the rest of it, but in terms of actually taking decisions, it always comes at the last minute, and usually after the clock has been stopped. Well, we do, we know, we know all about resolving things at the last minute, so Bertie Ahern, can I ask you just to, to, to answer that. Lord Trimble believes Brexit is not posing a threat to our peace process and to the Good Friday Agreement. What's your view on that? Well, I don't think it should. I, I don't think it, it should pose any threat to the, the Good Friday Agreement. Um, and I do think if the political parties were in the Assembly, they would be able to play a, a far more constructive part than what they are in the wings. Um, you, you know my view on Brexit. I think it was the worst decision that the United Kingdom ever made in its history um, and there's a large part of them want to reverse it whether they will or not we'll have to to wait and see but I, I take it for that the decision is made I accept the democratic um, view that they they have made the decision um, it, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out um, the, the hopeful decision is that uh, Theresa May will get her way, which is effectively to say you're leaving the European Union, but really to stay in it. And to stay within the single market, kind of, but to stay fully within the customs union. Uh, but she's a difficulty. Uh, you know, she's, she has a, a minority government. Um, she's difficult people in her cabinet who want their job. Um, and she has to try and handle all that over the next few months. But I, I, this is going to play on. Uh, birds will fly, all right, but cows won't between now and the 31st of October, so we're not going to see a deal by the 31st of October. 
I think it'll be kicked out um, as it has been. It'll be kicked on the road another bit. Um, it'll be probably kicked on the road till March. Uh, the transition period will be lent in it. Um, it'll be kicked out till the other side of the British election. And God knows what will happen then, though. I don't have much faith in Jeremy either. So we, we'll, we'll just have to see what happens. But Brexit, Brexit, Brexit should not affect what's happening in Northern Ireland because it's going to go on and on. The chances of Brexit uh, being implemented uh, over the next short term is it, it's just not going to happen. You know, we can dream on, but I, I can think of far better dreams. So it's... It, it, <laughs> We, we, we'll, do, we'll just, Northern Ireland should get on with Northern Ireland and get on with all of the issues and all the huge issues that they have to deal with, not as big as the ones in the past, and Brexit will be sorted out. Um, Lord Twimble and his colleagues are doing a good job in the Lords of making sure it probably will be kicked out even longer. So uh, I know that's not your view, David, but, um, but you're having you know, there are problems there. But, Listen, let, let, let's leave Brexit aside and get on with Northern Ireland. To answer your question, it doesn't affect it. And I wish Theresa May and her successor, successor well in whatever will happen in the end. I don't see it something that will happen in the short term. Um, Gary Donegan, as you know, after lunch, there will be a particular focus here today on Colombia. And um, that was referenced by Monica McWilliams. And, uh, what do you feel our peace process and what we've been through over the last 20 years, what lessons can we really send out to the world and, and perhaps particularly uh, to Colombia? Can I just go back just you for a wee second there? Of course. I, I'm probably the only one who was reared on the border that's on this panel. And I lived in a, a little village called Newtown Butler. And, um, and, and one of the things that, that, that I genuinely fear uh, as a result of, of borders uh, is the fact that it's largely been invisible for so many years now, uh, not like when, when I was a child uh, and as a young person. And um, the reality is the proximity of the police barracks uh, to my own home in Newton Butler meant on one occasion, one of many, uh, mortar bombs were fired at the police station and uh, my sister was blown off the sofa, my mother was blown down the hall uh, in the house uh, due to mortar bombs being parked beside. So I'm not talking out of a vacuum here. I'm not talking out of something like, um, I, I'm not Dougal out of Father Ted. Uh, I am, in a sense, this is a reality. And my fear is that once a border, soft or hard, the moment that you place uh, a custom man, a soldier, a policeman, somebody in border security, you give the oxygen to the people of the shadows. And again, I don't speak from uh, a vacuum. Even in the last couple of years, the blood of a young man ran down the entry uh, of uh, uh, one of the entries in Ardoyne, uh, killed by dissident Republicans, men of the shadows. And I call them for what they are, the cowards that they are, the, the people who try to undermine the great work of the people that we're actually here. And my fear is giving those people the oxygen because, you know, I was part of a delegation that went to the White House and the State Department and people were talking about uh, economics and they were talking about all sorts of stuff. I'm talking about life and death, which is a different thing. 2,400 people are actually possibly alive today as a result of the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, that's almost as many that were actually lost uh, during the conflict and that's down to the work and it's down to the fact of of good relations and um, and it's so important uh, that that when issues like brexit uh, appear that it's not in smoky rooms and, and nice uh, leather chairs these discussions are taking place these people need to see what I've seen I've seen things in my life I don't want anybody else to see I have seen the destruction of what a bullet will do to a human head or to a body. I've had to touch skin to skin and anointing people whose lives have been taken from them by people of violence. I don't want, well, it's Brexit or anything else or the vacuum that actually exists here, to give these people 
uh, the opportunity and the oxygen they need because at the moment society is rejecting them society is calling them for what they are they hang the name republican or loyalism or whatever like that there they're gangsters that's what they are they're no different to the gangsters But they use the opportunity and they use those tags to hang on. And if they get the opportunity uh, of a heightened level on the border, let me tell you, within a couple of months, the first shots will be fired. And my fear is you'll see uh, uh, troops back on the street again. So uh, Brexit isn't something that we can just look at um, in terms of economics and in terms of uh, uh, people kind of talking from a vacuum. Get out on the street. As Pope Francis said, if you're going to be relevant, get out and smell the sheep. And I'm a culture from the country. Sheep do not smell nice. <laughs> they are stinking, right? And if you're going to smell a sheep, you tell you, you, you'll know about it. So you have to be out there. When it comes to uh, Colombia... Um, very, very briefly, Gary, because we are times against us, I'm afraid. Okay. When we have churchmen in the house, quite often we ask them to end proceedings with a prayer. I'm not going to ask you, uh, Harold Good, to end with a prayer, but to end perhaps um, with a message because you are renowned for the message of hope um, that you often bring to people who are, who are in despair right throughout the peace process. So um, perhaps you could speak to us today just briefly um, at the end of this panel um, a message perhaps of, of hope and why we should still have it for this process and for what we're trying to teach uh, and advise other countries who are, who are going through conflict and trying to find a way through it. Oh gosh. Um. <laughs> and, and briefly, please. Uh, <laughs> it'd be very easy to, uh, to and, and just to repeat so much of what has been said, not just uh, by the folks here on the platform, but by your response to what has been said, particular things that have been said, that's, uh, you've been speaking also, you've been speaking. And uh, I, I think the more opportunities there are for us to, to speak um, and not to remain a silent people. Uh, I know there are rallies uh, next week uh, under the title of We Deserve Better. And uh, we do deserve better. But uh, it's often been said, you know, we, uh, we get the politicians we deserve, uh, we get the politics we deserve, uh, whatever about the politicians. And very often we get the politics that result in our not being um, strong. And I mean, I was talking to a very person who I, I, I know very well and I, I respect. And she surprised me by saying, I don't vote any longer. What's the point? You know? And there's a kind of, there's a lot of that in our community. And we need to identify the people and the politics with which we can resonate. And particularly those who speak of hope and those who want to take us forward. Um, I think there's a lot of hope around. I, I, in my innocence or otherwise, I sent a letter out on Monday morning, uh, an open letter to the leaders of uh, DUP and Sinn Féin in particular. Very personal, open letter. The response, I, I don't know whether anybody would bother reading it. But the response from across our community, and I'm not saying this for any reason of self-aggrandizement or anything else, or plot, not at all, that's not what I'm talking about. But it seems to have resonated with a huge number of people in our community who are saying, yes, this is what we're looking And I based it on the stories of the people in Oma, who I said, they in their stories have shown us what we need to hear and do. And there's been, a, I think, a, a huge response to that 
not just to me personally, but through the media, I, I'm hearing it all the time, and I say it again, not for any personal reason, but look, somebody said, you know, uh, it's a conversation that we need to have, and it is, we need to have this conversation, but we need to do more than just talk. Conversations are a starting point, but we've got to take those conversations and clothe them with action and activity. Uh, our children, I have 12 grandchildren, and as of last week, one great grandchild. <laughs> uh, and do you know what? I, I, I go away with uh, my older grandchildren every year. I take them either on a boating trip at Loch Earn or off to Rathlin Island, as we did recently. And I try to have conversations with them about um, our situation and about what they think and their thoughts about our little country and our future. And do you know what? And these are, these are grammar school kids. They know little or nothing about our history and about the issues. And what worries me is they're not particularly interested. And we, I know there are those who are, but we need to help our young people there, the new generation, to translate to them in ways that they can understand what it is we're talking about when we talk about this agreement and about hope and about implementation, because they're the people who are going to have to do it. And we need to excite them about that. One of the appalling statistics is that there are now more young people who have taken their own lives than there were victims of the troubles. That's a terrifying statistic. Harold, what are we passing on? Harold, I'm going to have to, uh, I'm going to have to wind it up there. Thank you very much indeed. Please, can you give your thanks for Harold Goods, Lord Trimble, Father Gary Donegan, Bertie Ahern, and Monica McWilliams. Thank you very much. And I wish all of you a, a very pleasant lunch. Thank you very much for having us. <laughs>